My name is V. Capaldi and I have a brand called Paleo Boss Lady and how that came about was actually, I wasn't trying to build a brand, it just seems that my message resonated with a lot of people. In 1986, a long time ago, I got very sick and we weren't sure what was going on with me but I lost feeling on the left side of my body. I was having a lot of facial distortion, uh, basically like my lip would just move and my eyes would blink and my vision was a little off and I, it, it seemed like it happened overnight. I went from, went to bed one night and was fine and woke up the next day and just really wasn't. I mean, that's really how it felt, this whole health episode or scare happened. And they originally said to me, well, you've an inoperable brain tumor and we're not going to be able to do much, so just sort of hang on. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's great. Thank you very much. And luckily, you know, I was encouraged by other people, get other opinions, see other doctors, don't believe what you hear from the first doctor. And I went around to a whole bunch of other doctors and I was really grateful when I walked into this one doctor's office because the first thing he said to me is, you don't have a brain tumor. Like not even looking at tests or anything, just looking at me. And that was the first time anyone looked at me first and like talked to me and he was like, I don't think you do. But this was before MRIs were like a available mode of, of you know, imaging. And he said, there's this new technology right outside of New York, actually, because at the time I lived in Philadelphia. And he said, it's an MRI. I need you to go there. And I need you to have one of those because I think there's something going on, but I don't think it's a brain tumor. And the CAT scan really can't differentiate from what's a tumor and what might be something else. But this MRI is going to cost over 10 grand. And insurance doesn't pay for it because it's kind of new. And so I had to figure out a way to be able to pay for it. And then once I did, I went and had this MRI. And... At the time, it was just so foreign. It was in a trailer in the middle of a parking lot. It was really loud. They didn't give you earplugs. I mean, it was a very scary thing, but I, I just wanted to believe what this doctor told me and that I didn't have a brain tumor and I was going to be able to live a nice life. And um, then after that, he said, well, I see stuff and it's definitely not a brain tumor, but I'm not sure what it is. I would like to do a spinal tap because it may be multiple sclerosis. And as luck would have it, and it is luck, I went from a death sentence to a life sentence and was diagnosed with MS at the age of, I got sick at 23, I was diagnosed at the age of 24, and at that time there were no treatments, no cure, we just knew that it was a progressive disease and that the likelihood of my life um, being affected, uh, basically usually with mobility or vision, was a probability, but it would be, we didn't know when, how, it would manifest and you know the amazing thing is is that at that time there was no treatments no cure and the only thing that the doctors offered me was Valium and my mom was a prescription pill drug addict so I chose not to take Valium I also um, started doing everything that Western medicine traditional healthcare told me so disease modifying drugs came out I took disease modifying drugs I actually was involved with the FDA with the pre-testing of the disease modifying drugs um, and then with MS they were injectables so I injected with disease modifying drugs which caused a lot of problems so then I started taking drugs for all the problems that the disease modifiers you know fast forward by the time I'm 37 I'm disabled I've lost bilateral use of my hands I'm having trouble swallowing, I'm living in pain, I have a rib girdle, my out-of-pocket health care costs are over $30,000 a year, life is just not working out for me at all, and I was like the best patient. I did everything that the doctors told me. If they said do PT every day, and I went to physical therapy, and the physical therapist said this is what we need you to do, your home program, like I did it exactly what they told me. And then I got on the board of the National MS Society, so now I'm like, okay, I'm with the people that are you know, looking to find a cure for this. And I really just believe that, you know, I could beat this and I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't. And in 2003, the doctor told me that I had moved on to the most debilitating form of multiple sclerosis, which is secondary progressive MS. And I was in Philadelphia at the time and I couldn't drive and couldn't really do a lot and I was married and my husband drove me home and he you know of course we were very upset and he said I'm gonna go to the movies and he went to the movies and he never returned so now I am unable to care for myself for the most part I'm deserted by my partner and my daughter is entering her senior year in high school and I knew that she was gonna go away to college and 
you know, I'm, I'm scared to death <laughs> because this is a progressive disease that I'm just told has gone on to the most debilitating form, which for most people that have MS, that means that we lose our ability to move our body. And what kills most of us is that we choke. And I was choking on thin air all the time. So I just always thought of Liz Lemon and 30 Rock when she would always be like, I'm forever single and I'm going to be eating a TV dinner and choke and no one's going to know I'll be dead. And I always thought, well, I'm going to be the new version of Liz Lemon, you know. I'm going to choke from MS and no one's going to know. And one of the biggest debilitating things that MS delivers to me is um, I have no ability to regulate body temperature. And for a lot of us with MS, if we overheat or get too cold, it literally incapacitates us. So when I get really warm and hot, I physically can't move my body. And when I get really cold, it hurts to move my body, my joints. I feel like the Tin Man, you know, and I, even oil isn't going to help. And after my husband walked out on me and my daughter was, I knew was, she got accepted to a college in Boston and I knew she was going to leave, you know, to go to school. I decided to take a bold move and move to California, to Venice Beach, California, where the weather is between 55 and 75. You don't need air conditioning to try and save myself because I was going nowhere good and I was completely alone and so I packed up everything the day my daughter moved to Boston and I moved to California, which seemed like a really smart thing because I was in the beach every day, I was, it's a much slower life out here than on the East Coast, hustle and bustle. You're motivated to exercise every day. Like at back east, I would literally go to the mall in the morning in the winter just to be able to walk a little bit to get some exercise. But it's really hard to be motivated when it could be 100 degrees or negative 10 within six months of the year. And again, because my body is affected by that, it just made it really hard for me to maintain movement. And movement not only kept my body in a good place, but my mentals as well. So when I first moved out here, it was like, wow, like I'm so smart. I thought I was a genius. I'm like, everybody should move to California that has MS. It's like the smartest thing you could do. But then in typical MS fashion, what looked like a good idea all of a sudden wasn't a good idea. And the level of disability that I came out here with just accelerated quickly. And I found myself now living out here two and a half years and my health care costs were getting more and MS delivered alopecia so my hair started falling out in clumps. I had a candida overgrowth that I couldn't control. It was all over my whole body. Um, and at now the use of my hands before I could use them a little bit but now I was struggling to feed myself, dress myself and use the ladies room so now I required full-time help. and. The choking was getting more and more, so now I required that I had to have people living with me because the Liz Lemon reality was real. I was having severe throat spasms, so you get Charlie horses in your feet and it, they get like stuck. That was happening in my throat, and so now they're putting me on high-level muscle relaxants, and with people with MS, you can only take the MS-specific muscle relaxants to a certain milligram, and then after that they put a pump in you, and everyone that I had seen with the pump in them it does the reverse, so your body's spasming so much that it becomes, they call it rigid, where it feels like a, like your metal, like your arm is like metal or your leg is like metal and you can't bend it or move it. And then they put these pumps in you where basically you become a vegetable, like you, you're going to be in bed for the rest of your life. And that's truly where I was. And as luck would have it, in that short time that MS went into remission in my 20s and early 30s, um, I built a lot of technology companies, so I was very successful. And at the time, I, um, when I started having full-time help, I did have a lot of money. I mean, by American standards, I had a couple million dollars in the bank, and I had no debt, and I bought a house with cash and redid it so that as my disability kept you know, affecting my mobility, my house, I figured, well, I'll live in it until I die. It's totally set up to help me. And in America, when you have a situation like this, it doesn't work that way. It's going to bankrupt you because you're going to take drugs that are going to give you more side effects and then you have to take more drugs. And the standard of care in America is if you have MS, you have to have an MRI every year with gladinum injected in you, which is a radioactive dye. And you have to have this test and that, all these tests, which I did them every year. And every test, they just didn't say anything. Like, it didn't change anything. They're like, oh, okay, we just looked at your brain again for, you know, the you know, like we have for the last 30 years and injected you with radioactive dye, but we're not going to change anything. We just wanted to see what your brain looked like. So I went along with everything. And 
when it got to the point where I looked at my money and I looked at how my expenses were and I looked at how I kept becoming more and more disabled, the only options that I saw before me were institutionalization and I did a study and found out that the second largest population that lives in institutions in America and youngest are people with multiple sclerosis. The first are people with um, uh, mental issues, usually um, you know, self-harming mental issues. And um, I just didn't want to live in an institution for the rest of my life. I was in my 40s and um, then I could be homeless. And when you live in Venice Beach, California, that doesn't really seem like that bad of a life, I have to tell you. So I was like, well, okay, well maybe I'll be homeless. And really then the other thought was, was to take my own life. Um, so I decided, as any rational human being would do, um, I decided I was going to go to Burning Man. I don't know if you know what Burning Man is, but it's a festival in the desert. A lot of people might think it's a freaky festival. I went to Burning Man for a few reasons. I wanted to see if, if I had the guts to take my own life. And about the fourth day in the temple, it was like a brick hit my forehead. And I was like, maybe my life is a problem. Like maybe some of the, because when you have a lot of money, like I did at that time, you don't, it's hard to know if people are with you because they're with you or they're with you because whenever we go out to dinner, you always pay the bill or, because I was sick and I traveled a lot, I would always pay for a friend to come to help me. Like, it's hard to decide why people are in your life. And I had some questions because as I was getting sicker, I noticed that less and less, those people weren't around as much. You know, as my needs were greater, they were more scarce. So that really stood out to me. And so I came back from Burning Man and I locked myself in the house for a year. And after about two months, um, I was actually very sick at this point and I was in bed and I'd been in bed for three days and I couldn't use my hands so I used the computer with my voice. So I was remember I was in bed and I was yelling at the computer, food, medicine, MS, lifestyle, doctors, help me, like we're there. And then all of a sudden a TED talk came up the day it hit and it was Dr. Terry Walls, it was called Mining Your Mitochondria and here's this woman standing showing a picture of her in a tilt reclining wheelchair saying, I have multiple sclerosis. And I was in a tilt reclining wheelchair and she's, and I remember listening to it and thinking, I just dreamed this, this is not real. Like I'm definitely, oh my goodness, like this woman is walking and she's saying that she did this with food. So I watched it once, I watched it a second time and by the second time I am now in bed bawling my eyes out. Like I couldn't even breathe and I was like, I'm gonna do exactly what she says. So January 1st, 2012, I started following the Walls Protocol, which is a modified form of paleo. And paleo, for people that don't know, is we lean proteins, uh, organic vegetables and fruits. We don't eat grains. We don't eat gluten. We don't eat refined sugar. We don't eat legumes. And we try and eat organic and grass-fed and wild-caught as much as possible, if you can. If you can't, that's still fine. You'd still be considered eating paleo. And by the following October, I started going off the medications one by one because as my symptoms healed, I didn't want to take the drugs anymore because of course I didn't need them. By July 4th, 2013, I moved independently for the first time in my life. I was able to use my hands, my swallowing issues went away. The left side of my body, which had been dead since the age of 23, like I couldn't feel it. You could stick a pin in it, you could punch me, you could, and I would never even know it, woke up. Still doesn't feel the same as the right side, but it's awake. Like, you punch me now, I'll punch you back, you know? And it's really, and I started managing every symptom that I had for multiple sclerosis. But in that year that I locked myself in the house, I became really lonely. So I was telling every, like, the, you know, my daughter and, and the few people that I did keep in contact with, like my PT and my acupuncturist at the time, and they were watching all this, and I kept telling them, you know, it's food, you know, food is so important. I was already moving my body. I already learned how to love myself so that when I plugged in food, it was like, wow, wow, this is like amazing what is happening. When I told people food was helping me, it wasn't received very well. It was almost like me saying that I was using food and healing myself. They heard it as you're still eating a standard American diet and you're not smart, which is kind of a weird translation as to what I was telling them. But people weren't really embracing it. Most of the time they were asking me to just stop talking about it. So my PT at the time was like, you should just call yourself Paleo Boss Lady and have a social media page because 
talk to people that want to hear about it. So I did. And very quickly learned that there's a lot of people that wanted to hear about it. So my need for companionship and friendship, because I was lonely after I decided to lock myself in the house for a year, turned into a very fast-growing page on Facebook, which has now grown to be a brand. As of today, I'm the most healed person in the world who has secondary progressive MS using diet and lifestyle alone. I take no drugs and I see no doctors and I have no out-of-pocket health care costs at all other than insurance premiums. I completely take care of myself. I spend, I don't see a PT, I don't spend money on a yoga class, I don't, I don't spend money on anything. By 2016, as any rational human being would do, I decided that I would sell all of my possessions, throw them in a fiat, and went on Facebook and said, does anybody want me for free to come to them and live with them and show them what I do? So I am now two years traveling all over America, living with strangers for free, opening what I call my bag of tricks and showing them how I move my body, how I feed my body, how I meditate, everything that I do, hoping to inspire their journey, not to tell them how to do it, just leading by example and helping them to build community. And um, two years in, and now I actually have a van that is gonna be converted into a green and recycled home so that the barrier to entry for anyone to have me come and help them is much less because they don't have to give me a place to stay. I've dedicated my life to be of service. And um, you would think that most of the people that invite me have MS, but that's not true at all. In America, one in five are disabled. The fastest growing sector in disability is autoimmune. It affects mostly 75% women. So I'm invited by people, you know, one in five disabilities. There's lots of reasons why people are disabled, mental, physical illness. Um, and then there's a whole category of people that do have things wrong with them. They haven't felt well, but they can't figure out what it is. So they don't have a diagnosis, but they're just trying to get healthy. So my work goes across all, every, you know, it, you just have to be breathing. And if you invite me, I'll come to you. And I'm grateful that since I started this journey uh, two years ago, I'm now a TEDx speaker. Um, I have won five different awards. I've been recognized as one of the top 50 people changing healthcare in America. Um, my blog has won an award. My tour has won an award. I've uh, been a rising star in the, in the blogger world and um, I'm nominated for three other awards already this year. And we're only in January. My tour has a waiting list, which is sad, but not. I mean, it's, I'm grateful that I can tour and help people, but I have over 200 people waiting to see me. So I'm just sad that there are that many people out there that need help. And I really believe, and this may sound very strange, but um, I really believe that I am on this earth for this purpose. Um, there's a reason why I've been able to heal even greater than Dr. Terry Walls because Dr. Terry Walls doesn't take disease-modifying drugs, but she still does require some medication. I don't take any medication. Um, I don't ever have to see a doctor or get an MRI or... Matter of fact, if something did happen to me, I don't even have a doctor. I mean, which to a lot of people would be really scary, but MS still lives inside me and it still will rear its ugly head, but I have this big bag of tricks, I call it, filled with tools that I just go in my bag of tricks, pull out what I need and apply it and MS runs scared. And most people that have a debilitating disease, we sit in fear of what it's gonna take from us. And I did that for 25 years, but now it's, MS is no match for me right now. From what time I go to bed, to the clothes that I wear, to what I wash my clothes in, to the hours in a day that I eat, cause now I only eat eight hours a day. I intermittent fast, I go every quarter for 72 hours without eating, I follow my circadian rhythm when I sleep, I never worry about money, I only wear recycled clothes, I eliminate every toxin that I can control in my life from friends to substances in my house. Um, I actually was just learning yesterday, I mean I only buy recycled clothes anyway, but about just even like I always bought cotton thinking, oh cotton's like the best thing I could put against my skin, but there's pesticides on cotton and they're putting that in clothes. So I'm still even wearing cotton pesticide clothes, like just learning all, learning as much as I can to be able to treat my body with gratitude for all it affords me and how it lets me move my body freely. And 
Um, the more that I do all that stuff, the more my body continues to defy the odds and heal. And I would recommend for anyone that has anything going on, whether it's MS or autoimmune or even anxiety, depression, cancer, whatever it is, the first thing I would do is have a real conversation with myself about the way I live my life, you know, and how, how do I look at myself? I think that self-love and realizing that your body is your temple is really the first step because otherwise if you start moving your body and feeding your body healthy foods because you have an issue, a disease or a sickness, you almost feel like you have to do it and you might feel deprived or, and then you don't, success is harder. Whereas if you can come at it through a loving lens, like for me, when I look at my plate of vegetables every day that I'm gonna eat, where before I'd look at it like, oh, I want a pizza. Now I look at it and like, body, I moved freely all day and now I have a big present for you. So it's just a whole different lens and it's not like, oh, I have to eat my vegetables. It's like, yes, my body functions great every day and now it's, it's watering the plant. Now I'm gonna give you some water and some fertilizer so that tomorrow we get to do it all over again. So I look in the mirror and I'm like, yeah, like you, you're so deserving of all this. And for 40 something years, I looked in the mirror and was like, oh, you have a pimple. Oh, your hair's a weird color. Oh, you have cellulite, you know? So I think just making sure that your narrative regarding your relationship with your person being spot on is gonna be the first step. And then you'll define food. You'll figure out what's gonna work. Cause I'm a Walls warrior, I follow the Walls protocol and paleo, but for some people it might be vegan or vegetarian or they might do better with, you know, an autoimmune protocol. You know, everyone has to biohack. You know, that's a big key word, which is, you know, trying things and seeing how it fits with your body. So I would recommend, you know, experimenting and trying things, but do it from a loving, a self-loving lens. Cause that's where the magic happens.